Good morning, everyone. It's the last class of the quarter. I, I want to say thank you before we even begin. Having your feedback has been very helpful. I'm, I'm very grateful for it. Uh, this is a, a big responsibility, and so knowing that it's meaningful to you has been very helpful. Um, the topic we're in today, uh, it's unfortunate that we're not together in the first place, but especially now with this class, because this topic begs for discussion. It, it, it's so nice to be teaching in a class, uh, not recording to a video, because we can engage in dialogue, and the dialogue is helpful for me. Um, it's helpful, helpful for the rest of the class because it inspires uh, uh, other discussion and lots of thought, things that we just, some of us might not consider. But um, if you want to discuss anything from this class, by all means, reach out to me and um, I'd be happy to talk about it. So we've been looking at um, um, David and Solomon, and Solomon in particular over the last few weeks. So now, uh, as our last class, we're going to be talking about Solomon's um, most distinct work, and that is the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, this is not going to be a thorough look today. In just a short period of time that we have, we're not going to be able to do it justice. Uh, there is so much material in this book that we could spend probably an entire quarter discussing. So what I'd like to do is encourage you to um, actually read the book, of course. Uh, it's not a very long book. It's 12 chapters, but they're short and uh, it's an easy read, and you will find uh, a lot more than I'm able to discuss in this class. I also want to make sure you understand uh, that I want to give credit to my sources. Obviously, I have read the book of Ecclesiastes. I believe in reading that, that is God speaking to us, and so I certainly acknowledge what comes from that. Um, I read uh, commentary and uh, gain uh, perspective from that. Um, and there's a guidebook that was provided to me uh, by Daniel when this quarter started. And then lastly, uh, I have discovered that there is some real good uh, content on YouTube. Um, in particular, I have discovered two men uh, David Pawson, who I've talked about before, and another gentleman named Alistair Begg. Uh, it's, co it's just coincidental they're both from across the pond, but um, uh, they provide very interesting uh, discussion, very interesting insight into Ecclesiastes. Alistair Begg and David Pawson. So I would encourage you to uh, look them up, and certainly it would be virtual plagiarism if I didn't acknowledge that um, I was quite inspired by some things they had to say. So as we jump into Ecclesiastes, I think you would agree everyone in this world is looking for happiness. They're looking for purpose and fulfillment and meaning, um, desperately searching for it. If you look through uh, a bookstore or a library or online through Amazon, whatever, you're going to see thousands if not millions of titles about everything related to fulfillment and the secret to happiness. One of the business authors that I like to read is a guy named Donald Miller. Uh, and Don Miller uh, just puts out content all the time. One of the things his most recent releases is called The Five Keys to a Fulfilling Life Plan. And that strikes me as interesting, especially given this study, that um, uh, he, he has the recipe for a fulfilling life plan. Now certainly, I would encourage everybody to, especially young folks, to take the time to think about what they want their life to be like and not to be uh, just influenced by anything that comes along, but kind of set some parameters. What do they want their life to look like at the end? But is the, is the end going to be fulfilling? That's the question that we would want to know ahead of time. 
The Purpose Driven Life is another book. It sold 50 million copies. Um, it, it's just amazing that, that that topic was so inspirational that it sold that many copies. The fact is, everybody is looking for a happy life. We want our life to be the best. We want the best clothing, uh, great car, great truck, whatever. All the things that we think go into a great life. Uh, that search is part of our DNA. Tony Robbins, if you're familiar with who he is, um, extremely worldwide, well-known, uh, popular speaker on self-help, uh, is worth $500 million, if you believe what is written about him on the web. Um, think about what we have in the world today. For almost everybody, in the palm of their hand, rests a connection to the world. People have access to instant communication, instant information, and instant gratification. And yet it seems like, more than ever before, there is confusion, uh, just rampant confusion. You, you look at uh, gender confusion. Uh, somebody said there were 56 different things you could select as opposed to male or female. Uh, you look at the divorce rate, um, internet, connect uh, internet connections that people are searching for uh, through dating sites and, and lots of other things. Even major career changes, uh, while they're not wrong by any stretch, but people, people find themselves looking for that fulfillment, and sometimes it requires something radically different. But regardless, it is fulfillment that we're looking for, uh, and sadly, uh, a lot of things that people are looking into don't provide any happiness at all. Ecclesiastes is the story of Solomon doing just that. Solomon went on a quest looking for it. Of course, he had all the wisdom that God had given him. Uh, he had the resources, he had the power, everything he needed. If anybody could do this, it was Solomon. Uh, so as we look at this book, I, I'm not gonna be able to dive into all the details. There is so much there, but as I said before, I hope you'll read it. And as you do, you're going to find yourself asking questions like, is this coherent? Um, is there any structure to this? Uh, is it optimistic? It seems kind of gloomy. Is it fatalistic? Um, for example, in uh, chapter 9, verse 11, Solomon says, Again, I saw under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. So you ask, is that encouraging or is that depressing? Uh, and certainly Paul, uh, excuse me, um, uh, Solomon is going to be spending his whole time kind of bouncing back and forth with that type of question throughout the entire book. But this book is all about the human experience. It's, a, it's about our desire to get everything out of it. And um, through the entire struggle, uh, we are working against a feeling of pointlessness. So as you read, you're going to also be asking, is this a bitter old man or is this a wise old man who is trying to warn the younger generation? He says, rejoice, O young man, in your youth and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes. But then he goes on to say, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. So on one hand, it's encouraging, enjoy your youth. But at the same time, keep in mind, you're going to answer for your actions. So Solomon, uh, as we well know, Solomon was... Um, uh, the richest, wisest, most successful king, and he was able to use his wisdom, resources, and power on his quest, and he did, in fact, explore everything. And the result, he begins and ends the book with this statement. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. In this case, vanity means basically it's pointless. Uh, to Solomon, everything seemed like a breath. 
Uh, in fact, the Hebrew word um, is Hebel, H-E-B-E-L. Uh, Job even used it when he said, my days are a breath. So Solomon recognizes uh, very clearly that despite all of these things he's done, all of the things that he has access to that mankind can do, eating, drinking, uh, just enjoying life, we cannot be satisfied. Um, think of the people you know through either personal relationships or uh, people you read about who have been phenomenally successful, uh, just, just success beyond anybody's wildest dreams, and yet there is still a sense in them that it is not fulfilling. Uh, Bill Gates, for example, uh, ceased running Microsoft and has been pursuing humanitarian efforts, uh, a tremendously well-funded foundation that is honestly doing very good work. Uh, Solomon pursues the first thing, which is wisdom. Now you would think being the wisest man, that shouldn't have been a pursuit, but he actually was discussing wisdom as a pursuit uh, in the first chapter, 12 through 18. And so on one hand, he freely dispenses wisdom as useful, wise advice to the young, but in the end, it by itself is not fulfilling. Uh, that useful advice is things like uh, the value of a good name, uh, don't carry on like a fool, uh, exercise patience. He even gives financial advice uh, when he says, make sure you diversify your investments. How true is that? But again, wisdom for him was ultimately unsatisfying. The wisdom Solomon and others have uh, explored even today is pointless and there's one reason and he acknowledges that several times throughout the book uh, very explicitly wisdom apart from God is pointless number two uh, he pursued pleasure uh, again with his resources he was able to uh, give his heart anything he desired but in the end even it was pointless um, and then lastly, he was able to acquire all the possessions he wanted. In uh, chapter 2, beginning in verse 4, he goes on to lists, list all these things that he had acquired. Houses, vineyards, gardens, parks, uh, entertainment, treasure, concubines, silver and gold, flocks and herds. Uh, it's a long list. The key ingredient here is all of this was in pursuit of himself. Uh, there was nothing he was looking for for anybody else. This was everything about what he wanted. He accomplished a lot. Uh, he pursued arts uh, in the form of music, architecture, pictures, uh, entertainment. Uh, he was a very good businessman. And of course, he enjoyed fo food, wine, and women, and the pursuit of philosophy but it all came to nothing. In verse 11, he said, Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. In other words, it wasn't a big deal. By the time he had gotten to the end of his life and looked back on all these things, he realized he had gained nothing from it. And so through this book, despite the uh, acknowledgement of the futility, his rambling and seeming contradiction, he recognizes both the power of God and the inability for us to achieve God's wisdom. Uh, in chapter 12, the end of the book, he is an old man who reminds the young one very important point. He says, remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few 
and those who look through the windows are dimmed, and the doors of the street are shut, when the sound of the grinding is low, and one rises up at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of song are brought low. What he's saying here is an acknowledgement, you are going to get old, and in the process, while you're still young, remember who your creator is. And then he admonishes them to remember the source of the wisdom. In verse 11, the words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. Now, what's interesting here is his use of the word shepherd. It's not coincidental. It's actually capitalized. Uh, so just like his father, he recognizes the nature of God as shepherd and guide. guide. In continuing in verse 12, he said, My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. How many people today are pursuing knowledge apart from God? And Solomon is here warning us that anything beyond God is fruitless. And at the very end of this chapter, he gives the most important instruction. He says in verse 13, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Solomon knows it's a critical mistake to trust in our own wisdom. So several years ago when Steve Blackman was uh, uh, with us at Bellevue, he reminded me of something that I had not stopped to consider. He said, in everything of the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, it all points to the cross. Uh, we look from the Old Testament forward, it's pointing toward Jesus. We look from all the way back in the New Testament, back to Jesus. And this is certainly no exception. Solomon may not realize it at the time, but he is looking for pure, transformative wisdom. And through him would come Jesus Christ, who certainly, as God, as, as God in the flesh, gives us access to his wisdom. So we remember, fear God and keep his commands. Well, Jesus obviously embodied that. Uh, he loved God and he loves us. So many people are out there doing good works and yet God is not part of the equation. But to love God is the essential step and where real value is found. And Jesus fulfilled that mission because he obeyed both. Chasing after the good life apart from God is meaningless. He says that in chapter 2 verse 24, for apart from him who can eat? So Solomon is not admonishing us to avoid life's pleasures. Uh, through God and, and according to God's plan, uh, God wants us to enjoy pleasures. He is the author of, of all that, but it's with gratitude that we should be enjoying these things as coming from God. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Number two, Unlike Solomon, who was looking strictly for his own fulfillment, uh, our focus should be on others. What can we do for the good of other people? And then lastly, recognizing that Jesus is the ultimate gift. If we stop and think about how magnificent the gift of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is for us, uh, that is transformative, and we will look at life in a, in a much different way. Um, so man has uh, always been searching and continues to search. Uh, Alistair Begg, who I referred to at the beginning, said, Our hearts are restless until we find rest in God. And isn't that true? Our hearts are restless until we find rest in God. Isn't it interesting how many people look down dead-end roads for fulfillment and will not consider Jesus? Stephen Hawking, uh, the noted physicist, had something interesting to say um, when he said, even if there is only one possible unified theory, it is just a set of rules and equations. 
What is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe? The usual approach of science and constructing a mathematical model cannot answer the questions of why there should be a universe for the model to describe. Why does the universe go to, the, to all the bother of exi existing? Uh, that was from something he wrote called A Brief History of Time, which was one of his bestsellers. He goes on, we are each free to believe what we want. And it is my view that the simplest explanation is there is no God. No one created the universe and no one directs our fate. This leads me to a profound realization. There is probably no heaven and no afterlife either. We have this one life to appreciate, the grand design of the universe. And for that, I am extremely grateful. So if you, if you look at what he's saying here, he's contradicting himself. He recognizes there's a grand design, and he recognizes there's a void. There, there is a purpose there, and he can't find it, and yet he will not look to Jesus. And even he says there's some doubt for him about heaven when he says there is probably no heaven. And then lastly, he uses the word grateful. And my question is, grateful to whom? In 1 Corinthians 1, 18, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Unlike Hawking, Solomon's uh, uh, accomplishment through all this was through wisdom and humility, he accepted the power of God and that God is not constrained by anything certainly not the laws of science that he imposes on us. In 11 verse 5 he says, As you do not know the way the Spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so do you do not know the work of God who makes everything. Isn't that true? No matter how hard we try, no matter where we look, we are not going to be able to understand God, except that God completely loves us. In chapter 3, Solomon also notes that God orders the times. So we're fools to think if we can attain the wisdom of God, but Solomon knew the fundamental truth. Fear God and keep His commands. In Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8, Paul wrote, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So here Jesus is exemplifying what we're called to do. Fear God and keep his commands. He was demonstrating his love and pursuit of fulfillment for other people. What was the result of this? Continuing in verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Everything described by Solomon, he always uses the words under the sun. I'm not sure how many times he says it, but it is numerous. He's always looking under the sun. We're called as Christians to have a different perspective above the sun. In Colossians 3, Paul writes, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And he goes on and he gives us exactly the kind of wisdom that we need to live our lives every day. He says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and controversies, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, 
But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one of you has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So through this book, we understand some of what wisdom is, but this passage teaches us the essence of wisdom. So the question I have for you is, even as Christians, are we getting caught up in pursuits under the sun? How are we going to turn and find the full wisdom God expects us to have? The answer to those questions is found through Jesus and studying the Bible. But it's a question of how are we going to approach the Bible? Are we going to pro approach it as Solomon did with his relationship with God with humility and reverence because we know God is speaking to us? The more we dig into the Word, the more is re revealed. It's not additional truth. That, that never changes. But it's the way the truth impacts our lives. And there is where we have meaning by impacting other people's lives. Consider, by us sharing the gospel, the, the full wisdom of God, the thing that people are really looking for, we have an, an, an exponential impact, not just on the lives of the people we touch, but the people they're going to subsequently touch. So by doing that, we are relieving suffering, not just in this life, but in the life to come. Ernest Hemingway, um, was quoted as saying, life is a dirty trick, a short journey from nothingness to nothingness. Here's a man who didn't know Jesus. The world is hungry for the right answers, and are we doing our part to share them? I hope every one of you has a great week. Again, it's been a real pleasure uh, leading you through these classes.